In my last video, I explained how quantum annealing relates to the other forms of quantum computing, and also the kind of problems quantum annealing solves. In this video, I'm going to explain how the quantum annealing processor actually works. So let's start by looking at a single qubit. Now a qubit can be in a state of either 0 or 1, and these states are encoded in a circulating current and a corresponding magnetic field. Now because a qubit's a quantum object, it can be in a superposition of the 0 state and the 1 state at the same time. And in the quantum annealing process, what happens is that each qubit goes from this superposition state into either the 0 state or the 1 state, which are classical states at the end of the anneal. And the physics of this process can be shown in an energy diagram. To begin with, there's just one valley, and the lowest point corresponds with the superposition state of the qubit. And when quantum annealing is run, a barrier is raised, and this turns the energy diagram into what's known as a double well potential. Here, the low point of the left valley corresponds to the zero state, and the low point on the right valley corresponds to the one state. Now the qubit will end up in one of these valleys at the end of the anneal, but how does it decide which one? Well, well, everything else being equal, the probability of the qubit ending in the zero or the one state is even. There's a 50% chance it will end in either state. Now the interesting thing is you can actually control the probability of it falling into the zero or one state which is done by applying an external magnetic field to the qubit. And the effect of this is to tilt the double well potential, increasing the probability of ending up in the lower well. This external magnetic field is called a bias, and the qubit's basically minimizing its energy in the presence of this external magnetic field. Okay, so being able to control the probability that a qubit will fall into the zero or the one state is a really useful feature. But the real power of these processes comes when you start linking them together and they can start influencing each other. And this is done with a device called a coupler. And a coupler basically defines how qubits influence each other. So a coupler can make the two coupled qubits want to end up in the same state. So that's either both zero or both one. The coupler doesn't care which one of these it is, as long as the qubits end up with the same state as each other. Or, alternatively, the coupler can make the neighboring qubits want to be in the opposite states. So either zero, one, or one, zero. When you've got a coupling between two qubits, you're now using another phenomenon in quantum physics called entanglement. When two qubits are entangled, they now have to be considered as a single object, but now which has got four states. So you can imagine a potential with four states, each one corresponding to a different combination of the two qubits. And the relative energies of these states depend on the biases on each qubit and the coupling between them. Now, when I said that the coupler wants the qubits to be the same, or wants them to be opposite, what I really mean is the couplers are making those states energetically favorable. So if the coupler wants the two qubits to be the same, really what it's doing is lowering the energy of those two states in comparison to the other states. And if the coupler wants them to be opposite, then it's lowering the energy of those states. Each qubit can have a bias applied to it, and the qubits can interact via the couplers. And as a user, you can actually choose all the values for these biases and couplers, both the direction of them and also the strength. And this is basically how you program a quantum computer. You choose a whole set of biases, a whole set of couplings, that defines an energy landscape, and then the quantum annealer does quantum annealing to solve and find the minimum energy of that energy landscape. So now you can start to see some of the complexity of these machines. With two qubits, I've got four states I can define an energy landscape over. If I go up to three qubits, the number of states goes up to eight. 
And for each extra qubit I add, I actually double the number of states I can define this energy landscape over. So the number of states goes up exponentially with the number of qubits. And specifically, that relationship is 2 to the power of n, where n is the number of qubits. Okay, so let me summarize what I've talked about. So in quantum annealing, you start off with a large set of qubits, and each qubit is in a superposition state of 0 and 1. And also, they're not connected yet. Then, they undergo the quantum annealing, where the couplings and the biases get introduced and the qubits all become entangled. This large quantum object then changes the probability that each qubit will end up in the 0 or 1 state. And then finally, at the end of the anneal, each qubit ends up as either 0 or 1. And this final state is the minimum energy state of your problem, or one very close to it. And all of this happens in our chips in around 20 microseconds. Thank you.